USA is the oldest think tank in India. It was established in 1870 and it plays a major role in furtherance of India's UN peacekeeping endeavors. Our partner in this webinar, Indian Council of World Affairs, is the premium think tank of India's Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, and it was established in 1943. This year, we are conducting a series of webinars on the UN-related issues in collaboration with the ICWA. The inaugural one was held on 27th February on the issues of principles of UN peacekeeping and mandate. And the last one, which was held on 25th August, was on dynamics of composition of troops and diversity and its impact on the UN peace operation. In between, we deliberated on the impact of climate change on UN peacekeeping operation in collaboration with NUPI and SIPRI, and then UN peace operation hostage taking of the UN peacekeeper. Uh, on conclusion of each webinar, uh, all these talks are being compiled and printed as a monograph to share the rich experience of uh, speakers with larger audience and uh, cross fertilization of ideas. I'm glad to inform uh, that monograph on our last webinar, that is UN Peace Operation, hostage taking of UN Peacekeeper, has been just published. I'll be sharing this uh, with you all. Uh, but today we'll be deliberating on the UN Peace Operations with focus on protection of civilians. My deep gratitude to Colonel Dr. K.K. Sharma, Dr. Ali Hamad, Dr. Cedric from Nupi, Norway, and Brigadier Dhananjay Singh uh, from Unmis uh, from Sudan for accepting my request to share their rich experience and deep insight on protection of civilians in UN peace operations. We are also fortunate to have the presence of a number of uh, UN professionals and practitioners in the today's event. My special thanks to Mr. David Harry, Director, Policy Evaluation and Training Division, UN Department of Peace Operation, to accept our invite to deliver the keynote address. But uh, before we proceed further, a few words about the basic theme of the today's webinar. India has always followed the path of dharma or righteous conduct. And it was prevalent in India long before modern humanitarian jurisdiction uh, evolved. Dharma-based norm for armed conflict was found on the principles of humanity and humanitarian ground, with high importance attached to the uh, distinction between the combatants and the non-combatants during the armed conflict. Civilians were not attacked, and on the contrary, they had to be protected. Thus, the need to spare civilians in the armed conflict have been acknowledged by millennia, and its origin can be found in early religious texts. However, it was only in the second half of 20th century that protection of civilians was firmly universalized and codified following the landmark 1949 Fort Geneva Convention related to protection of civilians in time of war. Need for protection of civilians is now widely acknowledged and since developed into a law, but not much in practice. Thus now, majority of the UN peacekeeping operations have been given protection of civilians as one of the mandate, and the operational capacity and preparedness to accomplish it has been expanded. But how do the UN peacekeepers protect the civilians? This is what we'll be deliberating it today. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Mr. David Harry, the Director of Policy Evaluation and Training Division, the UN Department of Peace Operations, UN Headquarters, uh, will be delivering the keynote at this. But as I shared with some of you, that due to the major time difference and his commitment tomorrow early morning, he has sent me the, or he has shared his uh, uh, keynote address as the form of a video. We'll uh, play the video what we have received from the Mr. David Harry. So over to the uh, David Harry for the keynote address. Ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely regret that I'm unable to join you today, and I'm very much honored by the invitation uh, to speak on the protection of civilians at this important conference. Uh, I thank the United Services Institution of India uh, and the Indian Council of World Affairs 
for co-hosting this series of events on UN peacekeeping, and especially today's event. Protection of civilians, or POC, is at the heart of UN peacekeeping in all of our largest missions. It's our greatest ambition, our most critical success, or potentially a source of our most critical failures. It's also one of our most challenging tasks that every day we must strive to do better at, to be more effective at, because tens of millions of civilians across these missions look to us with hope. Over the past year and a half, the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified existing protection concerns in peacekeeping settings. However, we are proud to report that with the support of peacekeeping stakeholders, especially troop and police contributing countries such as India, our operations have navigated these unprecedented times and continued to deliver on their mandates, including the protection of civilians. And this is an opportune time, therefore, to reflect on the protection of civilians mandate, the challenges we face, and our future direction. And what better host institution uh, to join this reflection? Uh, India has been a pioneer, of course, and a leader in UN peacekeeping, deploying more than a quarter of a million people in dozens of missions over several decades. And this deep dedication is reflected in India's deployment today of over 5,000 personnel across nine uh, peacekeeping missions. The three missions with the most Indian personnel deployed, those are ANMIS in South Sudan, MONUSCO in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and UNIFIL in Lebanon, are all implementing POC mandates in difficult, different, always challenging circumstances. India has also been a pioneer in gender parity across peacekeeping and its deployment of the first all women contingent um, in the mission in Unmil, the form police unit deployed in 2007, is an example that has led the way for gender parity in UN peacekeeping. And this is an essential part of our outreach to local communities, the ability to engage with women uh, in particular is an important aspect of providing for protection of civilians and more in terms of the engagement of UN peacekeepers on the ground. And I want to say at the outset that India's support and investment in peacekeeping has been a sound one. Many studies, independent of the UN, by academics and think tanks, have found that peacekeeping remains the most successful multilateral tool available to the international community. That doesn't mean we succeed every time. We go to the world's most difficult places and face some of the most difficult challenges. And despite the increasing number of threats that we face, complex environments, dwindling resources, sometimes absent or stalled political processes, many of these empirical studies show unambiguously that the presence of peacekeepers correlates with fewer deaths, less spread of violence across borders, shorter conflicts and increased negotiated settlements in civil wars. Let me turn now to protection of civilians in peacekeeping in particular. It's a priority mandate for six of the 12 peacekeeping operations. And sadly, this reflects that a peacekeeping operation in such contexts often creates an expectation that all those at risk will be protected. And it must be realized, of course, the peacekeeping operations have limited resources. It cannot protect everyone, everywhere, at all times. And just as importantly, we must always remember and remind our host governments that national authorities have the primary responsibility to ensure the protection of civilians in their territory. The Security Council has given clear direction that where mandated, POC must be prioritized in decisions regarding the allocation and use of available mission capacities and resources. As a result, strategic decisions must be made by mission leadership about which threats to prioritize. And missions have developed tools to facilitate this decision making, such as the use of hotspot mapping to monitor areas of greatest concern and then deploy resources accordingly. We can 
and should expect that peacekeepers will proactively protect civilians where they have the capacity to do storm components only. And while that's an important part of the comparative advantage that a peacekeeping mission can bring, POC is actually a more holistic approach involving a range of tools. Indeed, the operational concept for POC in UN peacekeeping is composed of three mutually reinforcing tiers. First, the protection through dialogue and engagement. Secondly, providing physical protection. And thirdly, creating a protective environment. And all mission personnel, therefore, civilian, police, and military, have a role to play across all venting violence against civilians before it occurs. That means our POC efforts must be rooted rather in community engagement, responsive to the threats faced by affected populations, recognizing and supporting the role that communities themselves play in their own protection. The sustainable protection of civilians can only be achieved through long-term solutions that facilitate political conflict resolution, engage communities, and support the host state to have the will and the capacity to protect its own population. Peacekeeping missions are having an increasing impact through integrated and tailored protection strategies which use all of the tools available to the mission and rely on the skills and comparative advantages of the civilian, military and police components. To give just two examples, in the DRC, MONUSCO has developed comprehensive regional strategies to address the diverse threats in various areas of the country. And these strategies balance dialogue and political engagement, the DDR, disarmament, demobilization, or reintegration of armed groups, community engagement with the threat of military action. And these have been successful in reducing the threats to civilians. Uh, in Mali, MINUSMA has conducted campaigns for the protection of civilians in the northern and central regions, providing a security umbrella for civilians to bring communities together, strengthen local conflict resolution mechanisms and support state judges to return to those areas and enhance the rule of law. And so we see the coming together of the presence of the mission capitalizing its skill and its resources to then catalyze communities and host institutions to come together and try to enhance protection. Yet despite these efforts, there remain important challenges. Peacekeeping operations are increasingly deployed in countries where peace agreements are weak or non-existent. A large scale violence between armed groups is ongoing. Protecting civilians is of course paramount in these situations, but ongoing conflict makes our operations risky and difficult and means we often lack genuine protection partners. So we must often focus on physical protection above all other measures such as I was describing. But this is why it's critical that protection of civilians is carried out both at the operational and the political levels. We need peaceful solutions to conflict to create protective environments where civilians are safe. And therefore, peacekeeping missions use good offices and other capacities to resolve conflicts at national and local levels. But this also means that the political efforts of the mission must be buttressed by regional, international and coordinated efforts at the Security Council level um, to support the search for peace and to um, provide leverage so that the parties are brought to the negotiating table. Another challenge, of course, that our missions face is where host states themselves limit or impede the work of the mission. And while POC is unequivocally the prime responsibility of the host state, and a peacekeeper's first course of action should be to support the state. Unfortunately, peacekeeping missions currently operate in contexts where the host state limits or impedes the ability of missions to carry out their functions, including for the protection of civilians. In South Sudan and increasingly the Central African Republic, restrictions are placed on the freedom of movement of the mission. In such cases, which amount to violations of the status of forces agreement between the UN and the host state, active, regular and consistent dialogue with host state authorities is necessary to resolve the issue. But beyond the mission level, which 
must be undertaken every day on a day uh, on the ground. It's important that efforts are undertaken by the Secretariat, by member states, and the Security Council to ensure that the host state understands its responsibilities and allows the mission to do its work as mandated by the Security Council. In even more complex cases, elements of the host state themselves pose a threat to civilians. For example, when security forces engage in predatory behavior on civilian populations. The protection of civilians mandate requires the mission to protect civilians regardless of the source of the threat. And our, mission must, our missions must try to engage early and at the highest levels with host governments to prevent su such harm, to bring this information and advocacy to the attention of the host authorities and use all means possible, political as well as operational, to address these threats. And where that engagement is ineffective, as a last resort, the mission may need to interpose itself between civilians at risk and host state security forces in order to protect civilians. Such action is authorized by the Security Council under the POC mandate and may ultimately be necessary to save lives. The final challenge I would like to mention is the need to ensure the sustainability of our efforts, particularly in circumstances where peacekeeping missions themselves are drawing down and transitioning to a different sort of UN presence in a different configuration. This is something we've seen, for example, uh, in Darfur, in Sudan recently. And all peacekeeping missions are indeed, and we should hope that they are, temporary uh, measures. And therefore, transition planning should start from the inception of a mission and include clear benchmarks for the mission's success and exit. These should be informed by meaningful consultations with host state authorities and local communities. Mission protection strategies and protection planning should likewise consider sustainability from the beginning. The role of national institutions should be increased, the role of communities in their own protection as the mission begins to draw down. And tiers one and three of the POC concept I mentioned, namely dialogue and engagement and creating a protective environment are particularly geared towards longer term protection. Then when sec the Security Council considers uh, reconfiguring, drawing down or closing peacekeeping missions, the continuing risk of uh, violence against civilians must be taken into account. Managing transitions in a way that sustains efforts to protect civilians in partnership with host states, UN entities and other actors is critically important. To address these challenges, uh, there are a number of things which we believe must be prioritized. First, we need clear, focused, sequenced, prioritized and achievable mandates from the Security Council. Now more than ever, Member States and the Secretariat need to work together to better tailor mission mandates, configurations and resources to address the needs of conflicts at that specific moment in time. Second, we require particular capabilities tailored to each peacekeeping context to effectively implement the POC mandate. Peacekeeping operations are increasingly becoming more dynamic and complex, and we need to ensure that we have mobility, uh, situational awareness, peacekeeping intelligence capabilities. These are some of the critical niche capabilities which we need in order to operate in such complex environments. In most areas of our operations, we need units which are agile um, and can operate in greater flexibility with enablers mm -hmm. that ensure the mission facing multiple threats of the large areas can be nimble and move quickly. We also need more women peacekeepers, civilian, pol police and military deployed across all roles and functions. French speaking troops and police are also required given that our largest missions with POC mandates are deployed in francophone environments. These will allow us to more effectively interact with local communities, build confidence in the work of the mission. The upcoming peacekeeping ministerial meeting, which will be held in early December in Seoul, Korea, will be an opportunity for member states to demonstrate their commitment 
requirements. And finally, in terms of addressing the challenges that I've mentioned earlier, for the civilians, we need to ensure effective pre-deployment and in-mission training on POC to encourage a proactive mindset. To enable an integrated operational approach to POC, we've deployed context-specific POC trainings, which have been delivered in peacekeeping missions in the Central African Republic and Abyei, and will be rolled out in other missions as pandemic travel restrictions are lifted. In the end, the guidelines, policies, and training materials put some paper to uh, put on paper to ensure that all the effectively. But we also need personnel who are of the highest caliber and fully committed to their responsibility. To rely on personnel that have the courage in the field from the leaders of our this is essential power to protect civilians for this is the standard by which UN peacekeeping touched and in conclusion therefore it's important to recall that the effectiveness of peacekeeping depends upon commitment and action from all stakeholders the Security Council member states host countries troop and police contributing countries as well as the UN Secretariat um, I should also include regional actors and indeed the affected communities themselves okay. all have to come together to ensure the effectiveness of our mandates and this need for engagement for all partners is captured in the secretary general's action for peacekeeping initiative and our current strategy for its implementation a4p plus and with this initiative the Secretariat has developed an implementation strategy to accelerate progress and renew momentum on the various commitments under the A4P uh, initiative, focusing on strategic and operational integration, capabilities and mindsets, accountability of peacekeepers, and the accountability to peacekeepers by those who should refrain from uh, attacks on them and a number of other priority areas, including enhancing uh, the, the transformation of digital technologies in peacekeeping and the use of uh, women and with the women, peace and security agenda across the peacekeeping mandates. All of these are new priority areas that we would like to advance in order to ensure that we're able to meet the challenges that we're facing, as I've outlined earlier. So thank you for the opportunity to share these reflections on protection of civilians and UN peacekeeping. I look forward to hearing more of what was discussed and I wish you every success in the conference. Um, and, uh, and thank you for your time. Hi, Hello. Hello. Uh, our thanks to uh, Dr. David Harry. And I'm sure the few issues which he has brought out, the speakers will be covering up in some form or other. Particularly, I like to draw attention of speakers to the points which you have brought out, hotspot uh, mapping of the uh, areas where the protection of civilian is must, then proactiveness, then capabilities, resources and their capabilities. I'm sure the speakers will cover up in some form or other. Before I hand over uh, to the moderator, let me introduce uh, Colonel uh, Dr. K.K. Sharma, moderator for today. He is an Indian Army veteran and visiting fellow USI. He was military observer in UNTAC, Cambodia, and active member of planning uh, of the writing UN Capstone Doctrine on Peacekeeping and Manual for Trainers in the Office of High Commission of Human Rights, Geneva. He was associated with the planning cell of the peacekeeping operations in the Indian Army and was founding member of the Center for the UN Peacekeeping Center, which was uh, groomed under the uh, or raised under the uh, USI of India. He was awarded PhD uh, by the in the management by from the Switzerland and presently he is professor and a dean with the global education program at Chitkara University Chandigarh India. So I hand over to the Dr. Sharma uh, for taking the proceeding further. Over to you sir.
Thank you very much, uh, General Goswami. Uh, General B.K. Sharma, Director, USI. Ambassador Vijay Thakur Singh, DG ICWA. And our three expert panel members, good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to all the delegates. As per a report of the UN High Commissioner of Refugees, on 9th August 2021, gunmen attacked several villages and killed over 50 civilians in North Mali. In Ituri and Kivu province of Democratic Republic of Congo, over 1,200 civilians have been killed so far in this year. Early in May 2021, 10 attacks were recorded against the humanitarian organizations in a northwestern town in Central African Republic, in which 27 people were killed. And, in, and just two weeks back on 6th of October 2021, an attack near Bambari of Central African Republic left 15 dead. One of the common factors in all these three countries is that these have ongoing UN missions with the protection of civilians as one of their primary mandates. A valid question asked by many concerned groups, therefore, is eventually for whose benefit are these peace operations established? UNSCR 2020 report gives over 82 million displaced people worldwide by the end of 2020. This includes 26 millions counted as the refugees. As we all understand, this is a result of various conflicts and most are the victims of collateral damage. During the conflicts of past 30 years in Afghanistan, Iraq, Myanmar, Syria, Yemen, and a host of African countries, it was the civilian population which bore the brunt. Eventually, uh, in 1999, UN brought the protection mandate in the forefront. Even the high panel report in 2015 had listed top two priorities for the UN, political settlement and protection of civilians. All agree that an effective implementation of the protection mandate requires a comprehensive, integrated and well-planned approach in order to address the challenges that the missions with this mandate face. This was also the foundation of 2019 Protection of Civilian Policy, which provided conceptual framework, guiding principles, and key self considerations for the implementation of this policy. But for the formed military units, challenges lie in translating vague concepts of protection of civilians into realistic strategies and operational practices for their implementation. Thus, the issue is more complex than what we tend to believe. To enable us to understand the intricacies, intricacies of the subject, we at the USI of India and ICWA are honored to have three experts and practitioners of protection mandate with us. They will speak for 15 to 20 minutes each before we go into the question answer session. And the first theme is concept and core obligations of the UN. To speak on that, we are delighted to welcome Colonel Dr. Ali Ahmed, a veteran of Indian Army, a former peacekeeper, academician, and a former political officer in the UN. Dr. Ali was a research fellow at the IDSA between 2008 and 2012. His monographs at the IDSA were Reconciling Doctrines, the Prerequisite to Peace in South Asia, and limited war doctrine, the structural factor. After leading IDSA, he has been an assistant professor at the Nelson Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution in New Delhi, and was also a political affairs officer in three UN peacekeeping missions. Dr. Ali is a freelance blogger and has self-published 11 compilations of his writings with over 850 published articles and Thank you, Dr. Ali, and welcome. Over to you. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, I will be uh, brief. Uh, I will stick to the lower time limit that you gave between 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, to begin with, the topic itself, it says uh, UN peace operations. Um, 
and POC in the context of UN peace operations, POC being protection of civilians, the concept and the core obligation of the UN. That revised, uh, just to revise the, the uh, definition itself, it's the responsibility of the state uh, in, in the first order. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is uh, that peace operations are extant. You've got uh, to have an integrated and coordinated all of mission response, which would include prevention, deterrence, and um, response towards protection of civilians from physical violence. And I underline the word physical violence. Uh, within, and the caveats are within their capability and areas of deployment, and to the extent to use all force, all necessary means to include deadly force. So I think um, uh, the key words here are physical violence, uh, the limitations, the caveats, uh, and it's an all of mission approach. So uh, they're, they're that. Out of the way, uh, why I wanted to deliberately put the definition up front is because we need to distinguish protection of civilians from the UN system wide protection um, uh, terminology. Uh, the term protection, uh, there would be other uh, elements in the UN system other than peace operations that are more responsive to um, the term protection. So, protection of civilians in the context of peace operations essentially would mean a protection from physical violence. Um, David, of course, said that um, and has already uh, put through the concept. I wouldn't want to belabor that. So instead of uh, repeating him, I would then uh, just try and situate it in, in, in theory, peace studies theory. And that's where I think um, uh, even uh, um, we received this um, uh, concept itself of peacekeeping itself. Uh, you, you can imagine it as a triangle. Uh, you imagine a triangle with three, it's three uh, angles, uh, A, B, C, let's begin with C. C stands for contradiction or the issue or the dispute. Uh, B would be behavior that has sprung from that contradiction, behavior in terms of uh, violence. Uh, and A stands for attitude in terms of the cultural aspects to that violence and how uh, that then uh, enables uh, that kind of behavior uh, rather than uh, settling uh, the A, uh, the, the, the contradiction itself. So if we are to take this um, triangle A, B, C, um, UN peacekeeping addresses all three uh, angles. Um, let's begin with B. B is violence, and that's addressed by peacekeeping. A and C are left. C, the contradiction, is addressed by peacemaking, and A, the other third angle is addressed by peaceful. So what peacekeeping does is to try and bring about negative which brings about security so that the other elements of the UN system can go in and uh, uh, you know deliver on their respective mandates to include the peacekeeping operation. So peacekeeping is addressing um, B, angle, that is behavior, that violence, bringing about um, negative uh, uh, peace, but we need positive peace, that's important, and that then is delivered, uh, is if we, we are to go to positive peace, we address A and C, uh, correct, A and uh, C, yeah, A is attitude, which we could do through cultural peace building, and when we address uh, C, uh, uh, that's uh, the contradiction itself, that's through peacemaking, and that's through structural peace building in other words. So you change the structure and you change the culture, and then uh, you already put a lid on uh, the behavior that's violence. So while uh, you put the lid, that's to give you the time to be able to address uh, the other two angles, which is uh, the contradiction itself and uh, the attitude. So that's how you, uh, peacekeeping can be imagined. Uh, that said, the you, we are aware that peacekeeping has come a long way from its traditional outer. Um, yeah, post Cold War, you know, uh, there was an outbreak of uh, uh, problems across uh, the world that were otherwise stable by the Cold War, and the uh, UN went in in a big way that led to an evolution uh, of peacekeeping. Nevertheless, it hit, hit a roadblock or it hit um, uh, perhaps a road uh, um, uh, a barrier 
in terms of Srebrenica, Rwanda, Somalia, et cetera. And that gives us uh, lessons learned, which we kind of um, uh, amalgamated by the turn of the century. Uh, and uh, we uh, said that, look, we must, put, we must have people-centric operations. But from the interstate kind of uh, um, uh, uh, regime, we now go into an intrastate uh, um, uh, context or environment where people then are victims and therefore if UN operations are uh, extant, then they need to be answerable. Uh, and that's where POC then comes into its own 1999 onwards. You've got the history, not for me to repeat, but um, it has evolved considerably since in the last 20 years. Um, we moved from traditional to multidimensional peacekeeping. Multidimensional peacekeeping came into its own in the first decade of the century. Um, these are to address not only, uh, as I told you, it's to be imagined as a, a triangle. So not a peacekeeping addressing the violence part of it, but then the other two uh, angles need to be addressed too. And that's where multidimensional peacekeeping gives the capacities to the peace operation. And uh, then uh, the peace operation gets about both positive peace uh, and negative peace. Since it's a multidimensional operation and it's an all of mission approach to POC, obviously then uh, there is a, a systematization of how the peace operation approaches uh, POC. As um, David pointed out, then it got these three layers. That's how the POC policy has emerged. It's got these three tiers. First tier is uh, um, uh, engagement and um, uh, you know, the political process as such. Second tier is predominantly military, but not entirely so. And third tier is uh, a protective environment, which doesn't necessarily involve only the mission, but also the UN country team and the UN uh, yeah, uh, humanitarian team in that particular country. So you've got these three tiers and um, uh, the tier one, where the political process or uh, protection through engagement would be at all levels, it's at international level, UN Security Council, regional level, the regional body, um, uh, national level, in the national capital, and uh, at the local community level. And within the mission, you would have you know, political affairs and civil affairs officers, et cetera, addressing all that. Tier two, you've got the military, you've got uh, then peacekeepers, and they're deployed, you've got the UNPOL, and you've got POC advisors who are guiding and assisting on the tier, tier three to a tier two. Which, because we got a uh, physical protection centric POC uh, definition, obviously tier two assumes uh, importance, uh, but doesn't override the other two. And then there is tier three, which is um, uh, all of mission. Uh, the other uh, elements of the mission also jump in. Mass and child protection, women uh, advisor. Um, and uh, you know who's looking at um, conflict-related sexual violence, uh, and they then uh, with the UN country team and UN humanitarian team, um, uh, you know, address a tier the structure of a multidimensional uh, peace operation enables that uh, particular coordination because you've got a double hat with the deputy sec uh, representative of the secretary general. And SRS, Deputy SRSG, who um, uh, you know also has a foot in both the operation as also in the UN country team, and therefore uh, you are able to do that coordination. Um, so that's uh, how uh, it is conceptualized, and that brings me to the end of the concept part of my uh, uh, talk. Uh, uh, really, it was superfluous because David has already been through it, and you all know what we are talking about. But um, now let me address the second part, which is whether it's a core obligation of the UN. Um, core obligation of the UN may be stretching it a bit. Uh, not, I haven't come across this uh, particular uh, phrase in relation to the UN. I've come across uh, the phrases with this. It's uh, uh, one of the core issues of the UN Security Council. You know, it's a core activity. It's a key activity. But the core obligation by stretching it, especially because the principle is that it's uh, duty of the government, of the state. And uh, if we make it our core obligation, then there's kind of duplication there. I'm not sure we, we should be uh, stepping up, you know, uh, in the direction. Uh, member states would not have it. 
I see that particular dissonance uh, in, uh, you know, uh, peacekeeping, you know, uh, uh, see its development, there's been a bit of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, messianism of POC. Uh, it's, it's a good thing. I'm with it. I'm for it. I'm all for it. But I also member states. When we a state-centric body, uh, the member states bring uh, to the UN their divergent opinions and uh, views and perspectives, etc. And uh, one of the things they like to emphasize is sovereignty. You know, your UN should not be too intrusive. It should uh, support uh, governments at best um, and not try and dictate. Uh, POC messianism perhaps uh, makes it so. Uh, how did we get to this? As you know, when the uh, Cold War dissolved, we had a little bit of a new liberal moment, and uh, uh, the UN was seen, the consensus in the UN at that particular point in time kind of encouraged people to go down this road and then, you know, uh, try and uh, export new neoliberal values, you know, democracy, capitalism, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's where you get POC uh, being an instrument of that, uh, that narrative. Uh, I'm not sure it is bought across the world. That's uh, one of the uh, play, uh, one of the impetus or two of the reservations comes from that. Um, yes, it is central to the UN. Um, a POC should be. Uh, I uh, I uh, think it's uh, self-evident from the Security Council resolutions that are. Uh, plenty full out there. You've got uh, presidential statements. You've got open sessions on POC. You've got peace, uh, peacekeeping operations that also special political missions having mandates. And uh, you've got sub things uh, of POC being ex like child protection and conflict related sexual violence. You've also seen the secretariat being responsive. They've looked and uh, they even has spelled it out in terms of they put out a policy, a handbook, uh, you know, uh, training, etc. So I would say it's central and it should be that way. Core obligation, I would put a question. Uh, and as mentioned, A4P also privileges that. Insofar as the wider UN system concerned, outside of UN peacekeeping, uh, of Yes, you've got the other uh, agencies, funds, and programs, and other institutions like the uh, UNHCR, OHCHS, or, uh, the human rights uh, uh, institutions, and OCHA, the humanitarian uh, people in it. So, yes, um, uh, the, there might be a tendency towards core obligation, but we are not there the whole way, and certainly not as far as DPO goes. There are other pushback. The other kind of uh, two, three, um, uh, where the pushback might be coming from, one I've already mentioned in passing, that's the neoliberal book, um, uh, is, uh, you know, cultural relativism. We've got, uh, you know, human rights uh, being pushed. Uh, we've got WPS agenda. I think that's all for the good, at least personally. Uh, but. I'm not certain, um, you know, cultural relativists would uh, talk into that. Uh, they would say if it is, uh, you know, the conduit is the peacekeeping operation, they would put back and say, look, you are no one to be uh, dictating to us how we look at our women or how we, uh, you know, nurture children and that kind of stuff. I've heard this and that's why I'm mentioning Um and I guess then it, the pushback would also come through the national, uh, at the national level and be voiced in the chambers, uh, like for instance, the C34 committee of the General Assembly. And that's where I think uh, the, the, the reservations on POC being carried too far come from. So if POC is to go anywhere, they would have to contend with this kind of uh, blowback. Another point would be of the blowback is political economy. The political economy, look, there are gainers and losers. And if the, if the tier one peace process is pushing in a particular direction and making spoilers out of a certain other set of people, then um, those spoilers are then being addressed through tier two action, uh, robust peace, etc. Then uh, there are winners and losers. And um, the political economy 
would get uh, uh, if you or new piece of so from uh, the UN point of view. I've, I've been a, a military observer in Congo and we were surprised and for the first time in my life I saw uh, tr trucks going uh, with minerals which were 20 wheels on them. Even in India I had never seen a truck which had 20 wheels. But this was in the middle of a civil war in 2001. That's when we were in monitors and there was no, uh, uh, there, was no uh, there were no contingents there. So what I'm trying to say is that somebody gains from violence and conflict and if you uh, put a the peacekeeping operation, we, we must ensure that uh, they, the gains are not uh, to that particular force and the supporters of that particular force, uh, you know, set of forces. Uh, that said, um, now that comes, uh, brings me uh, to people who may be more interested uh, in, you know, robust peacekeeping. That's another, um, of course, uh, there may be no alternative. But I see uh, I see reservations within the contingents. So and they may voice through uh, through through contributing countries, etc. So if you're going to swat somebody on the arm, uh, you're going to you know swat them on the wrist. Then you have to have good reason to do so. And robust peacekeeping, yes, is very useful. You know you maintain uh, you you disregard tactical level consent and you maintain a respect for strategic level consent. Uh, all and must have the capability. The problem with that is importing uh, counterinsurgency uh, practices, the narratives and uh, logic from you know Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. And we know where we've been in Iraq, Afghanistan. So the NATO, you know, they've got their staff officers. They hold important positions within uh, UN system and uh, military force headquarters and the uh, you know, force headquarters, like say a chief of staff. Now, when uh, they come to those kinds of experience, find that look, traditional peacekeeping kind of persists with TCCs who come from, you know, these brown skinned people from South Asia, and, and they, are, they like to push UN uh, peacekeeping down a particular road of robust peacekeeping. Uh, I'm not certain that should be, uh, you know, taken uncritically. After all, we know what's happened to them in Iraq and Afghanistan. Also, the kind of proximity that UN seems to be having to the West is um, makes UN suspect in the eyes of uh, the host communities. And of course, we've got this counterterrorism template, uh, which obviously UN peacekeeping operations do not, uh, in, uh, you know, do not uh, do counterterrorism. But if the problem is, if we are going to be uh, take uh, seen or perceived as instruments of the West, as imposed on, say, you know, Mali, uh, Central African Republic, Somalia. Uh, Somalia, of course, you've got the African Union, but then they are, you know, uh, they are financed by the UN and supported by uh, this finance, but the EU that uh, logistically supported by the UN. So the point I'm making is the uh, we then um, uh, the TCC are then uh, targeted. Uh, that's perhaps accounts for uh, Mali's higher casualty rate. So these are two, three points I wish to flag, uh, and just to make it uh, you know question answer session entertaining and long enough. I think uh, I will just uh, recount those: one, the lib neoliberal uh, messianism; two, um, the cultural relativism. Three political economy for robust peacekeeping. I would like to end uh, with uh, one point from my personal experience and UNIS, UNMIS uh, during the crisis of December um, 2013 and UNISFA on underlining the tier one. Because I was a political affairs officer, uh, tier one is where we operated, and I found that we were deficient. And because we were deficient, the min the uh, the min the the missions uh, lean on tier two, unfortunately. So what we need to do, and Hippo report rightly says, there has to be a primacy of politics. So we need to emphasize that we must strengthen the political arm of these missions. One of the problems with this strengthening the political arm is UN has taken a step back, especially in the two missions I mentioned, 
in one, it's the, it was the IGAD that was to the fore in UNMIS when the crisis broke out. You know, the foreign ministers came when the crisis broke out and they said, okay, now Christmas is coming. We will come back after Christmas. And that's when Bohr, you changed hand almost three, four times. Uh, so uh, when we say primacy of politics, it must include UN being on the show window. Dr. Ali, uh, thank you, thank you, you very part. much. Uh, I, I will have right. A, I will uh, stop on that. Yeah. But um, uh, just to uh, uh, round up, I am for for obligation part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, you, know, you actually flagged a lot more issues um, uh, than just concept and core obligation which we're talking about. Uh, but one of the issues which you brought forward is that uh, there are multiple uh, <laughs> stakeholders who are working there in the mission and uh, many a times coordination, collaboration, uh, etc. becomes a problem. Uh, we have a, a, a very, very uh, you know, senior expert on that who is going to talk to us on challenges of divergent foci of the stakeholders. Uh, we are really thankful to Dr. Cedric in accepting to speak on this important topic. Uh, Dr. Cedric, unfortunately, will have to leave immediately after this to attend another uh, conference in Geneva. Uh, he is a research professor in the research group of peace, conflict and development at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. He co-directs the Lupi Center on UN and Global Governance and Climate, Peace and Security Project. He also coordinates the effectiveness of peace operations network, EPON, for which the USI had nominated me to be a part of the research work on protection of civilians. He contributes to the training for peace program, the UN peace operations, and several other projects. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cedric, and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharma and colleagues. It's really a pleasure to, to be with you all today. Thank you so much to the United Service Institute of India and the Indian Council of World Affairs for hosting us and convening us in this uh, series of meetings. Uh, from my side, maybe just to say, as, as my background is more on the civilian side and many of our other uh, presenters have uh, either military or ex both military and civilian experience like Dr. Ali, um, I, I served as a political affairs officer and a civil affairs officer in, in the UN peace operation in East Timor and also at uh, the UN headquarters and have worked more broadly on, on conflict resolution and peace building and peacekeeping and research on the civilian side. So I will perhaps try to emphasize that dimension of protection. And uh, maybe also just to mention in the context of the larger questions that Dr. Sharma also introduced when he introduced the topic of protection of civilians, that uh, through the research of this effectiveness of peace operations network that he has mentioned, and I'll actually just uh, quickly uh, put a link in the chat to the website of this network where you can also see some of the reports we are referring to. But I would say the some of the overall findings of the research that this network has undertaken in the context of protection of civilians is that most of these peace operations we have studied have contributed to preventing large scale conflict. And they have contributed to reducing the intensity of conflict, reducing the spillover from you know, one region or one country to another. And they've contributed to sustaining various peace processes longer compared to those places where we do not have peacekeeping operations. But they are not able to protect every civilian in uh, all of the time. That would require significant more resources if, if, if that's perhaps even you know, theoretically possible at all. So I think we have to be realistic about protection of civilians in that context and perhaps understand it as a kind of a the best for the most principle as opposed to trying to identify or look at every one individual case where perhaps it is not possible. I heard someone talking. Can you hear me well or is the interruption with the internet? It was just an interruption. I think Cedric, you go ahead. Okay, thank you. 
I'm not so sure I'm in a hotel here in Geneva and I was a bit unsure about the quality of the internet. So um, we have in this effectiveness of peace operations network undertaken research into a number of missions and with a special focus on protection. But I've been asked to specifically maybe touch on MONUSCO and UNMIS. And you'll find uh, reports on both those missions on the website that I put in the chat. But we also have a current another study underway at MONUSCO at the moment. And I think we'll have some reports out in November with a view to the mandate renewal coming up in December. And we will also have more uh, further work on, on UNMIS uh, later this year, early next year. So do keep an eye on that. So I will. I would like to emphasize uh, three points. Uh, first of all, that protection of civilians is not just about the absence of violence. We, we need a comprehensive and an integrated, multi-dimensional, multi-actor effort. And secondly, that effective protection of civilians needs close engagement with, with the communities at risk. And thirdly, that protection of civilians is not an end in and of itself. It's, some, it's, a, it's only dealing with the symptoms of the problem. So we need to, to focus much more on the overall uh, conflict prevention and management dimensions. Uh, that where we are successful with those, we will also contribute greatly to preventing uh, the risk of, of protection, or protection risk to civilians. So just to say a little bit, a few more words about the fact that uh, protection of civilians is not just the absence of violence and that we need a comprehensive approach. Uh, as Dr. Ali mentioned, of course, the, the primary focus has to be on the political dimension. Uh, as David Harry also mentioned, we have these three tiers and the protection of civilians policy of the United Nations peacekeeping operations. Uh, the political tier, which focus on preventing and, and managing and, and use this negotiation or political dialogue to try to prevent risk. So, for instance, for an example, in South Sudan, we know we have a seasonal movement, a transhumance movement of herders into certain areas. We know that that can create uh, you know, resource scarcity conflict with the farmers that they encounter. So to prevent that kind of protection risks, we can contribute to negotiating routes through which those herders can move and we can um, invest in setting up conflict resolution mechanisms before the conflict actually happens. So not just responding to it afterwards, but in that way, set up preventative mechanisms to deal with tensions as early as possible before they turn violent. So that's the kind of political work that we can do to ensure prevention. Then, of course, there's the physical prevention tier, and I'm not going to say much about that because we have many colleagues on the panel that can and, and, and know much more about that than me. And then there's the enabling environment tier. In other words, you know, the protective environment, which means the investments we make in community resilience, in security sector reform, in rule of law, and, and all of these different dimensions which create the environment within which protection is, is possible. So, and to do that, we need to work, you know, multidimensional, multidimensionally. In other words, on the political sphere, on the security sphere, on the humanitarian and development environment. In the case of Congo, for instance, Is there a problem in the network, uh, Dr. Cedric, or only I am not able to hear him? No, he's, uh, he's I think, gone off, off there. Because he's totally, uh, I think there's something wrong he was mentioning about. He's in a hotel. And then we have various civilian dimensions, uh, political, civil affairs, military, people working justice, etc. So all of these together is our investment in a comprehensive approach and an integrated approach. And although all of these actors together work towards protection, 
It doesn't mean, of course, that they all have share the same exact man and principles. There's lots that needs to be resolved, of course, in this process. And to do that, we we employ various instruments such as joint analysis, joint planning, coordination efforts. The leadership is very important. Performance uh, monitoring is very important so that we can generate the information we need to continuously adapt. And this can be both efforts led by the piece itself, or it could be the peacekeeping operation participating in efforts led by other agencies or by the government and so on. So I think the, the whole set of actions around ensuring that we have a comprehensive and integrated approach among across all these different stakeholders is, of course, critical to the success of protection. And the second point I wanted to make is that effective protection needs close engagement with the communities at risk. We are, protection is not something we do to others. Protection is something we need to do in support of the communities we work with. And there in both uh, the DRC and South Sudan, the UN has explored and developed and, develop and, and, and uh, um, initiated various um, projects and initiatives. And I think uh, innovated quite a bit over the years. So we have community liaison assistance in many communities at risk. These are individuals that are able to um, contact the United Nations uh, closest bases or regional offices and alert them to, to uh, you know, issues that require response. They are given phones and SIM cards and, and, and they are connected. We also have community alert networks and various other forms of, of engaging with the communities in question and engaging with them to understand what are their protection risks, how do they protect themselves, how can we support them? And on the military side, of course, we have SIMIC, or these days we uh, more focus on engagement teams. And I think the role that, for instance, our Indian battalions have done in, in, in South Sudan, where, by instance, by using veterinary services as a way of creating close relationships with the communities, and that then leading to, to the information exchange is also critical in this regard. And then lastly, I wanted to end off with a few points on making the, the bringing across the point that protection of civilians is not an end in and of itself right as i said before protection in a sense is only dealing with one of the symptoms of the conflict so we need to invest in this much more effort into politically and uh, in political conflict resolution and solving the core political problems at hand and i think one of the challenges with some of the protection of civilian mandates is that there's been an over-reliance on protection of civilians and not enough effort invested in actually resolving these conflicts. And I think this leaves us with what I would call a protection or a stabilization dilemma, in the sense that the more we are effective in protecting civilians or the more we are effective in stabilizing a certain situation, the less incentive there is for local and national elites in that country to make the political settlements, uh, to make the political compromises necessary for there to be peace. Uh, if we are solving the conflict problem for them, why do they need to invest in actually negotiating uh, with those who may have grievances or changing the system that, that favor them? So this is, I think, is one of the key tensions in, protect, in, a, in, a, in a strong emphasis on protection of civilian or stabilization in peacekeeping operations. So I hope that was useful. As uh, Dr. Sharma also mentioned, I am in Geneva at the moment uh, attending a conference here and I have a panel starting in a few minutes. So unfortunately, I won't be able to stay long for and be part of the discussion, but I do appreciate uh, being invited and being able to contribute to your conversation and I wish you success for the rest of your seminar. Back to you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cedric. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, great. Uh, very, very excellent overview. Um, you gave three very crisp points for protection of civilians. Uh, it requires an inter integrated effort. Uh, there has to be close engagement with a community at risk. And finally, of course, conflict management for the long term solution. Uh, you also brought out the res resource uh, scarcity conflict is arising every in fact today only in the morning i was reading a report where there are 
45 nations identified by the report, which will see water related conflict in by 2040. So uh, thank you very much. I think uh, your exposition has also brought out a very important role which is being played in the in the protection of uh, civilian uh, by various humanitarian units in the field. Uh, so what is the perspective from the field on the same? And eventually, who is actually responsible for the protection of civilian? So to know more about that and to cover perspective from the field on the challenges in implementing uh, protection mandate, we welcome Brigadier Dhananjay Joshi to speak on the topic. Brigadier Joshi is a serving Indian Army officer. He commanded a company as a part of the UN peacekeeping force in Lebanon, battalion in the counterinsurgency operations in Northeast India, and a brigade in a high altitude area in India. Apart from attending the staff course at Wellington and higher command course at the Army War College in India, he is a graduate of the U.S. National Defense University, Washington, D.C. Presently, Brigadier Joshi is posted as a sector commander, UN, UN mission in South Sudan, commanding a composite sector with troops from Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Nepal. Thank you and welcome and over to you, Brigadier Joshi. Uh, thank you, sir. Firstly, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Uh, at the outset, I wish to thank the USI and the ICWA for inviting me as a panelist on this webinar on protection of civilians. The speakers before me have very concisely explained the conceptual and the political dimensions of the topic. My endeavor as a peace uh, peacekeeper would be to give a perspective from the ground. And I shall largely draw on my experience as a sector commander in UNMIS, where I'm presently posted. But I'm certain that the realities and the challenges that we face here in South Sudan would be very similar to all those missions where protection of civilians is part of the mandate. And so therefore, I have uh, structured my talk into three parts. That is, firstly, I shall be giving you an overview of the operational environment. And then I shall cover the conduct of the operations as such, and then uh, I'll touch upon the challenges faced. So it is well understood in this forum that uh, the primary responsibility to protect lies with the sovereign authority of the country or the lawful government. And the UN is forced to step in when the government is either unable to provide protection or unwilling to do so. And the in so the UN presence is invariably with the presence of the uh, with the consent of the government and is meant to be an enabler. In the context of POC, what we see that we are usually faced with two scenarios. First, where the government is not able to provide security, and the second, where despite capacity, it may be unwilling to do so. The former could be due to any number of reasons like weak territorial control or a lack of resources or due to defunct institutions. The latter is mainly due to political reasons. And out of the two, the second poses more challenges for a peacekeeper because often it brings the peacekeeper at cross purposes with the lawful law enforcement agencies of the land. At the very least, it could result in a dangerous operating environment and uh, otherwise at least the working environment can get very frustrating. It is also possible to find a mix of both these scenarios together in a country uh, where we can get shades of both at the same time. So South, I shall uh, now try to correlate it with the conditions that we find here in South Sudan. So South Sudan is a large country. It is, in terms of size, much bigger than, I would say, France or Germany, 900 kilometers east to west and almost 600 kilometers north to south. It gained independence in 2011 
after a referendum and partition from Sudan. Though the youngest country in the world, it is also amongst the poorest with the lowest human development index. The South, the UN mission in South Sudan, that is on miss, started as a mission to develop state capacity. But within about two, uh, two years after uh, gaining nationhood, the government split into multiple factions and the nation was plunged into a civil war. In a rare move, the UN Security Council was forced to reprioritize the UNMIS activities. Instead of capacity building and extension of state authority, the foremost priority was given to protection of civilians, upholding of human rights, and the delivery of humanitarian assistance. The UNMIS force, the ceiling was raised from 7,000 to 17,000 troops. In 2018, a revitalized peace agreement came into force and the ceasefire is holding, but peace remains fragile. So the country has just 250 kilometers of metal roads. Heavy rains and flooding make all tracks impossible for almost six months in a year. The population of 13 million is composed into 64 different tribes. Tribal identity is very deep, overshadows the sense of nationhood. The country is being governed by a transitional government. The National Assembly is not fully formed and the constitution is still in the making. The central ministries and states are headed by military generals of different factions in a power sharing agreement. The peace agreement calls for unification of the, all the military factions into a unified army, that is the South Sudan National Defense Forces. But this remains an incomplete process. The country is surviving on foreign aid, but financial transparency is absent. The government does not pay salaries for months together and government departments get little or no funding. And even the army people don't get any pay. Now, as a result, of the civil war, the country is flooded with arms. It is common to find even cattle herders armed with AK 47s. The rule of law is absent. Gender based violence, conflict related sexual violence are common. So I have made some effort to give, uh, uh, dwell upon this background simply because it's important to understand where does protection of civilians fit into the overall context. I am certain that the conditions are similar in many other countries, but the net outcome of what I have described till now is as follows. Firstly, the country is big. Distances are huge. Surface connectivity is non-existent. Population is diverse. It is impossible for the UN to be everywhere. And no matter how weak or politicized the institutions may be, we have to work with them. Now, as major political factions here are signatories to the peace agreement, they are not fighting against each other, but a struggle for influence is still on. Now, despite an overall semblance of peace and stability, there are many ongoing conflicts at the local level. So you can have a situation where there is overall stability at the national level, but uh, Localized conflicts, which are equally lethal, are still going on uh, at regional level. And the local militias are often used as proxies by the bigger partner, by the bigger factions. The rural economy is pastoral, revolves around cattle. And while cattle raids between communities have always been happening for centuries, the proliferation of lethal weapons has brought a very brutal dimension to it. And so, uh, what was uh, kind of a ritual has now become a very bloody game where within a matter of few hours, you can find hundreds killed, villages raised to the ground, and severe human rights abuses taking place. The other part of it, that the scars of such violence are difficult to heal 
and in and in turn they will fuel future conflicts that they will become kind of a leading to a continuous cycle of revenge the other part of it is that violence displaces people irrespective of where this violence is coming from whether it is due to politically motivated or it is just a local clash it will displace people the last civil war in south sudan left 1.6 million people displaced internally and another 2.2 million refugees in foreign countries that is the neighboring countries now even as the return and rehabilitation of these people who had uh, fled in the past takes place uh, we find that any new violence creates new waves of refugees and therefore again compounds the problem it adds to the problem or new waves of refugees now we also feel uh, we experience that the internally displaced people invariably seek refuge either next to un premises or premises of the international ngos or the church and during civil war we found that more than 100 and uh, 100000 people who had poured into the un sites in various parts of the country seeking protection and that's how the uh, poc sites came about in the first place so though they comprised only 10% of the number of people who were displaced but the five poc sites presented a very unique and very distinct challenges for the un so many humanitarian agencies some acting under the un umbrella some acting on their own are working in the country to provide food and medical aid to the communities who are impacted by violence but the state of lawlessness makes south sudan one of the most dangerous places for these humanitarians so banditry killing killing of the uh, aid workers and looting of aid is very common so I, as i wrap up the first section of my talk i wish to tie in with where i started from that while the responsibility to protect lies with the government the success of un efforts varies with the degree of support which is provided by the government and the local law enforcement agencies and this support varies from place to place from time to time it depends upon political factors it also depends upon the state capacity so while uh, i would say that the un has to prioritize its presence and activities it can't be everywhere it cannot supplant state institutions even if they are weak or subverted so in a milieu where there are multiple factions with deep trust with deep distrust amongst themselves like i described the power sharing agreement in this country uh, maintaining neutrality is a must it is not just important to be impartial and transparent but it is equally important to be seen to be as such and say i would say that uh just to cite two examples like denial of access you may have all the clearances but still at a check post a patrol can be stopped and uh that's not very common and it's also not very uh, uncommon to find uh, accusations or kind of uh, false uh, allegations to say that the un is uh, supporting one faction versus the other so i would say that where institutions and procedures are weak rapo and personal equations matter and so for un peacekeepers especially officers they must have excellent leadership qualities and good interpersonal skills while the mandate gives the peacekeepers the authority to open fire and use force the biggest weapon with the un is the moral force and the respect that it carries and therefore the discipline and the personal conduct of peacekeepers is extremely important there is no scope for demeanors as i would say so here i end the first part of my uh, talk and i now move on to the conduct of un operations and for this i thank the previous speakers because uh, they have laid some ground for it and these points have been said again and again but the protection of civilians should not be seen as just providing physical security to those who are escaping from violence and in the and it has a larger context to it and as i see it i would say uh, it has five dimensions i'll just make use of a slide
And so I say that the first is preventing violence in the first place. The consequences of armed clashes can be staggering. Therefore, every effort must be put into preempt and data violence. And this calls for a robust intelligence network and maintaining a very high degree of situation awareness. The aim being to pick up signs of brewing tension, engaging with communities in time, engaging with the political leadership, the elites, and overall being proactive. I would also like to add that UN presence has a great sobering uh, uh, impact when uh, tensions are high. And so uh, the presence uh, in terms of patrolling, maintaining physical domination of the area and being visible has acts as a deterrent and a lot of time helps greatly in preventing violence. The second I would say is the dimension is the physical protection where uh, we have, if violence breaks out, then we have refugees and IDPs. And it becomes the responsibility of the UN to protect those who are escaping from violence or under or are under imminent threat of violence. So even when people have not sought its refuge uh, directly, it becomes the duty of the UN to reach out and try to get them under a kind of a prophylactic security umbrella. The third dimension I would uh, like to highlight here is human security. Now, uh, in uh, poor countries, we find that food scarcity can be both a driver of conflict and also a consequence of it. And if we extend human security, it can prevent conflict and also mitigate its effects. Another dimension of human security, I would say, is also the way we look and care for those who have moved into the uh, IDP camps or the protection of civilian sites. Now, in any of these settlements where people are running away from violence, uh, uh, they tend to uh, in, be in uh, very difficult situations. So displacement at any time firstly results in a loss of livelihood. And the IDPs or the internally displaced people, they face hunger, starvation, disease, death every day. The camps invariably, invariably become huge slums where clean water, sanitation, public health, medical care become life challenges. And not to mention crime, because uh, you could have a situation where there are uh, communities of people from different tribes within the same, the same camp and the same tensions which drove them to violence the outbreak of shame takes place happens within the camps. So crime, ethnic polarization of communities within the camp are also live realities. Women and girls are especially susceptible to exploitation and abuse. Therefore, sound management of the camps, rendering of humanitarian aid to those affected, it also assumes importance. The fourth dimension, which I wish to touch upon, is providing security to the humanitarian workers. They have a huge role in conflict prevention, but the state of lawlessness makes it extremely dangerous for them to operate by themselves. Protection provided by the UN peacekeeping contingents enables other civilian partners like the World Food Program or the UNICEF to operate with confidence. And lastly, fifth dimension I would say is the strengthening the respect for human rights itself. Now, patrolling by the UN, engagement with people spreads awareness and encourages people to report instances of violence, killing, looting, abductions, and all such things. Often, like it was highlighted earlier in the talk, these crimes are committed by government soldiers themselves. And the monitoring, investigation, and reporting of violations puts pressure on the government to control and bring such uh, acts or those who have committed them to justice. So in terms of deployment, I would say that with, with these five things that we have to achieve with the force that we have, uh, what we follow is a grid system of operating bases and a hub and spoke concept of operations where the from the base we reach out in terms of patrols to uh, all the places. 
and like it was brought out that all machines are now integrated and multidimensional so we have uh, the civilian vertical of the mission, which has got whole lot of people working on the sections of political affairs, gender, human rights, refugees, uh, child care. And then we have the humanitarian partners in terms of the World Food Program, the World Health Organization, the uh, UNHCR, and all of them are working together uh, uh, as a integrated teams to achieve the mandate. So when we go out on a patrol uh, from any of these spaces, it is invariably a integrated team where the force or the, the troop, the TCCs, they are providing the protection and it has representatives of all these other partners who are there and you go out and you touch uh, places as uh, all places in terms of short duration patrols, long duration patrols, aerial patrols, riverine patrols, and engage with the communities, uh, pick up signs of tension, deliver aid, and uh, strengthen the whole process. So this is how it is happening. Uh, I must add here, here the difficulty of carrying out patrols in this place. Like I highlighted earlier that uh, in this country, uh, we don't have roads. And due to rains and flooding, the tracks, it becomes very difficult to move out. But uh, uh, the effort to touch all places and like the aspect of hotspots was brought out earlier. That is that when we go out, the idea is to uh, go to places and prioritize and see that the places which require our greater attention are visited more often than others. So uh, just to give a snapshot of the kind of IDPs and uh, uh, the refugees who come in, and before I close this section, I wish to dwell a bit on the POC sites as such. Now, the POC sites or camps in South Sudan are a consequence of uh, the uh, civil war which had taken place in 2013. And never on such a large scale were the IDP settlements ever existed close to or within the uh, UN bases. So, uh, in the beginning, uh, these camps were uh, provided security by armed, peace pe uh, uh, armed uh, peacekeepers and uh, uh, and also the uh, providing of the aid was by the humanitarian partners. But this led to a blurring of the lines between the civil and the military. And that is how we find that the uh, UN police and the found police contingents came in for specifically for management of these camps. It was a unique experience for the UN here in, uh, in South Sudan. So, so just to give you a kind of uh, uh, picture of uh, one of the POC sites, uh, this was uh, what the pictures on the right are saying is what the camps were like earlier. And then when, they, when the sites, uh, 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 were better managed, they became more orderly like this. But but the number of people who are staying there, like I said earlier, was in excess of uh, 100,000 or and even more. So it has been seven years that these sites had come into being. And uh, over a period of time, as the situation stabilized, it uh, uh, we found that the IDPs were unwilling to go back and uh, they were more secure here, the life was more uh, comfortable here, and they were getting into a kind of a permanence. And that had to be avoided because it's not for the UN to look after uh, them endlessly. And at the end of 2020 is when all these POC sites one by one are getting handed back to the government and it is for them to manage them. And they are now called the IDP camps. The humanitarian assistance is still provided, uh, prophylactic security cover by the UN is still provided, but uh, all the camps have now got, uh, uh, been taken over by the government as such, the, uh, and except for one, and that would also go back shortly. So at this stage, I close this part of my talk and I move on to the last part, which is the challenges, which I will wrap up uh, uh, pretty fast. Uh, what I wish to say is that uh, the challenges in terms of the terrain, the distances, the ability to touch all parts of the country, th that, that is uh, no doubt about that. The, also, the part which was made earlier 
in the talk uh, was that uh, as the missions uh, things stabilize, there's a tendency to the downsizing takes place and the number of peacekeepers or the troops, they get cut. And uh, that is what we have experienced here also, but we find that the situation can change very fast. And uh, the lag between when the uh, troop cut is affected and uh, if you wish to bring in more people or stall that process is quite a bit. And suddenly you find that uh, you, you have the challenges on the ground remain the same, but the troops who are available to do and meet them uh, have gone down. And this is uh, uh, something which needs to be looked into and is not there. I not specifically mentioned on my slide, but I do wish to touch upon this, that the size of the force and uh, the number of troops we need has to be a very uh, careful decision and we should not uh, uh, rush into it. It has to be uh, the troop level may need to be maintained because the situation may change at any time. The other part uh, I would like to talk about is as the host nation resistance. Now, uh, the peacekeepers and the peacekeeping effect is meant to assist the government. And uh, where we need to be careful is not to be seen as an occupation force or a military force which is acting on its own. Uh, that's very important because as a sense of nationhood starts coming in, the, it, it, it strikes at national pride, it, uh, it affects people. And so the way we conduct our operations, the way we are seen by the, uh, the people of this host country uh, is to be seen as partners and, and enablers and not as somebody who's trying to run their country for them. So that, that is one challenge which I would say is very important. The second I would uh, touch upon is the limitation of peacekeeping efforts and which was just uh, uh, spoken so much by Dr. Cedric also, that peacekeeping is meant to plug a gap in governance delivery and can never replace the government. And in the absence of governance and, uh, and widespread lawlessness, peacekeeping efforts can do only so much. We can save lives, but the overall solution would only come from political engagement and a political solution to the process and protection of civilians cannot become an end in itself. And the third part I'd like to say is the representation of UN peacekeepers, uh, the women peacekeepers in UN missions, that uh, considering that women and girls are most vulnerable to violence, discrimination and exploitation in such kind of uh, disruptive societies, the ratio of female peacekeepers is very low. And uh, most countries don't have uh, uh, women in combat roles and therefore the troop contributing countries are unable to provide that many things. Now, while uh, we need to strike a optimum ratio of uh, male-female, while male peacekeepers uh, are there, but they may be possibly get only half the perspective and there are limitations in terms of uh, how they, they uh, interact with the communities which are most affected by violence. So in my personal opinion, the increasing women participation will yield better situational awareness and a better response. Sananjay, may, may I request you to wind up? Sir, I finish, sir. I, I just say that uh, if to conclude that protection of civilians is, as I, I have uh, tried to bring out, is about human security as a whole, going beyond the demands of uh, just physical protection. Security of those hit by violence, those who are displaced, cannot be ignored. And at the same time, the security of those who are providing humanitarian aid is also extremely important. So uh, uh, when we build resilient societies, when we engage with communities, we stabilize the situation that whole integrated process is important and uh, this protection of civilians should be seen in that context. I end here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brigadier Joshi. An excellent overview of the challenges in South Sudan and uh, especially uh, the viewpoint uh, from the tactical level, the kind of challenges which you are or your troops are facing there. Uh, you again uh, re-emphasized the uh, you know, theme which uh, earlier speakers were talking about that protection of civilian is the primary responsibility of the local government or the host country. 
uh, but I think South Sudan as other peacekeeping scenarios are very, very complex uh, because of the fragility of the peace. Uh, it was amazing to uh, see those uh, IDP camps uh, and the kind of uh, political violence can only disrupt the peace in these areas. So thank you very much. And the five dimensions of the UN operations were also very well brought out. Uh, in fact, uh, there are at least uh, five, six questions uh, specifically pointed at you, but we will take the question and answers uh, later. Um, I, I, I was told, uh, in fact, I came to know that uh, we have a colleague uh, from uh, South Sudan itself, Colonel Edward Carpenter, who has recently returned from South Sudan. Uh, and uh, though we are 10 minutes behind schedule, but I would still request him for a brief overview uh, on his own experience in respect of the protection of civilian mandate, please. Edward. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, it uh, was a really pleasure to uh, listen to, to Brigadier Joshi talk. I think he, he hit the points right on the head. Um, the things that I just want to highlight really quick. Um, so uh, civilian casualties overall, I think it's important uh, that we look at the fact that the 90 day report uh, by the secretary general really does contain a scorecard. But I don't feel that scorecard is ever used for anything um, during my time in UNMIS. Uh, every 90 days, the casualty rate went up, but there never seemed to be any consequences for senior leadership that we we weren't um, actually carrying out the mandate. Uh, and in fact, uh, 2020 was one of the worst years for civilian deaths. If you look at the 90 day reports recently, um, the numbers have still been very high. Uh, so I think it's important to, to understand that there is a scorecard and really ask how we're using it. Um, we talk about hotspot mapping. This is something where, again, most of the, uh, at least my experience at UNMIS, we knew where the hotspots were. Um, it's about how you react to them. And, and this goes back to the political will of the mission often, less, I think, the will of the, the peacekeepers, the, you know, the, the battalion commanders. I, I see colleagues from INBAT too here. Um, but that's, again, something that needs to be addressed at, at the higher level. Uh, in terms of intelligence, though, there is something that the large partners could help missions with more, and that is providing real-time satellite intelligence. Um, uh, Brigadier Joshi mentioned how difficult it is sometimes to actually move on the ground. Um, and some countries uh, allow the use of UAVs um, to collect intelligence. South Sudan is one where that's not an option. Um, but there is real-time satellite uh, data from most of the large nations, and they could provide that. Uh, so that's something worth thinking about. In terms of resources and capabilities, um, something, every mission is a little bit different. Uh, most of the Central African missions, uh, the road conditions are similar to South Sudan. Um, boats, uh, the use of riverways, waterways to get around um, is something that should be looked at. The use of vehicles, there are, um, the SHERP was uh, a vehicle that we tried to bring in to UNMIS. For the end of my term, uh, Brigadier, I don't know if those have actually been fielded yet, uh, but there are the Norwegians have some all terrain vehicles that are designed specifically to run on these types of, of muddy ground. Uh, but the, the reality is, is the APCs and the Humvees that we like to provide because they're what most of our forces have um, may not be optimal. And this may be a place again where the large donor countries who don't contribute as many troops, but maybe can help with the logistics. Could provide those for the peacekeepers who are actually doing the work. Um, the other thing that was touched on was uh, more women, but also the importance of local translators. Uh, the Brigadier General uh, mentioned uh, 64 different tribes. There's at least three or four major ones, and none of us speak Dinka or Merlay or Newer. Um, but there are local people who could be hired very cheaply. Um, the reality is, is that uh, it's very difficult within the mission. Um, to get that civilian leadership to prioritize a fairly small expenditure of money so that the local battalion commanders can have plenty of translators, local translators to go out with their troops. And even better, some of those translators are women. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on is the, uh, the link between DDR and POC. So one of the problems in South Sudan is that there is no formal DDR mandate. Um, and to the extent that there is any DDR, it's uh, it's never been really implemented um, as long as you have small arms in the hands of poor men. 
uh, you are going to have um, higher levels of violence. And DDR uh, needs to be looked at in a holistic way uh, to get the common soldier to give up his gun. Maybe $100 and a cow will work. To get a brigadier general to give up his battalion, um, you are going to have to offer him some greater incentive. Uh, and until you have a comprehensive DDR in most crisis areas, I, I think that you will continue to see um, uh, violence vectors for civilians. And the last thing I would say is that along with the civilian casualties overall, uh, it's important to look when we talk about the scorecard at also gender-based violence. So just because a woman is not killed, if she's raped or if her children are taken from her, I think that has to count as a, a failure of protection of civilians. And I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edward. And coming from a, a Marine, I know that without intelligence, you won't step your foot on the ground. Uh, but I remember that once upon a time, intelligence was a word, word which was never uttered in the corridors of the UN. Good to know that uh, now that is being spoken about. Uh, our colleague from the USI of India, Major General S.B. Astana, is a strategic and security analyst a veteran with 40 years of experience in national and international fields and the UN. He is currently the chief instructor at the USI. He is a former additional director general in infantry of Indian Army and was the chief logistic officer in UN mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea. He is also a regular speaker at the Center for UN Peace. May I now request General Shashi to offer his comments on any aspects of protection of civilian which have been left out by the earlier speakers and also his overall comments on the discussion so far. As uh, I said that we are a little ahead, um, you know, 10 minutes ahead of the time. So kindly keep it to the five minutes, please. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, let me uh, take off from where the speakers have spoken. Firstly, there was a point to say whether protection of civilians is core obligation or not. The fact that most missions as of today are stabilization missions, the fact that 95% of the peacekeepers are doing protection of civilians and most of them are mandated, this I think answers that particular part that yes, the uh, counter insurgency operations are not in the mandate, but the fact is everybody is faced with a situation where there are non-state actors standing in front of you he has got a gun you can't help it you have to prepare for it so we might as well prepare uh, when we go now when we talk of preparation certainly there is a need for capacity building now the capacity building is in very many terms one is the inadequate force uh, the brigadier mentioned it uh, you have to have the required troop density you have to require have to have the required composition police, uh, civilian and training and things like that. You need to have the required hardware. You need to have the digital empowerment. We, you talked of, you yourself talked of intelligence. Now intelligence is becoming important because you cannot protect civilians unless you have actionable intelligence and you have to have a preventive kind of approach or protection of civilians. And for that, again, you need intelligence. So therefore, these are requirements. Next is that you require a very apt mandate. Now, mandate formulation is a two-stage process. You know the politics which goes behind the mandate. And unfortunately, today, if you see uh, very senior officers in UN have been mentioning there is no conflict where at least one of the P5 members is not involved. And what in, it in, involves is you see the case of Afghanistan, a UNAMA mandate and the resolution. Initially, it was 13 pages had to be brought down to two pages because uh, P5 members don't agree with each other. And when it got diluted, it would actually even the word Taliban had to be missing from there. So this is the kind of uh, situation which is there and that impacts on your mandate for force application. Now, when you say force application today, can you believe it? A charter, uh, UN Charter 2 oblique 4 that says you can't use force. Charter 51 says you can use force against, uh, that is for self-defense. And Charter 42 says that yes, you can use force against collective security against a country. 
non state actor is missing there is absolutely no law and no resolution there were two resolutions made uh, after 911 uh, that is 1368 and 1373 and both of them were for that particular purpose the fact is that today when you face a non state actor he is a civilian and as per the un conventions as of today the vulnerability of the person is uh, of the peacekeeper is that unless he has actually uh, fired at you uh, when you do protection of civilians and if you fire at him you can be questioned and that is one of the reasons why you would have found that there has been certain at certain places there has been some reluctancy there has been some uh, risk uh, uh, taking and some bold commanders do take risk and the good part is that in united nations system anybody who has taken risk in good faith has always been appreciated similarly the problem of the impartiality now you uh, if the state is uh, acting against the people in some cases which are which are quite prevalent in a number of cases now in that case if you protect the civilian you find a situation uh, that uh, you are being uh, labeled for uh, favoritism you don't protect it then you are not doing the mandate and you are also uh, the hippo report was mentioned hippo report says in no uncertain terms and i quote the uh, you have to adopt a people centric as well as a state centric approach it there has to be a balance and a principle of non use of force that cannot be taken as an excuse of people dying in front of your eyes that is inexcusable so therefore the hippo report very clearly brought out the primacy of part uh, the politics remains but the sovereignty issue uh, and the human right issue both are relevant so that's one part of it then we come to the uh, shall we say the other aspect is the protection of the peacekeepers themselves now that is also becoming a very important issue because of the number of casualties which we have suffered there has been a santos cruz report on that there have been certain other reports uh, as far as uh, india is concerned let me also uh, apprise everybody we are launching a digital platform the indian mission uh, in un has already said so and uh, this is a digital platform for the uh, isr capabilities to increase the isr capabilities as far as intelligence is concerned we being professionals uh, our peacekeepers are very much ready for any kind of eventuality and operations and therefore we have flagged this issue that we need isr capabilities we need uh, such capabilities and we are trying to make a module uh, for that and that perhaps there is an mou already signed with the united nations uh, i finish here thank you very much i have lot to speak but i think the time is restricted thank you thank you very much thank you jal uh, shashi i think uh, very articulated very well articulated points thanks for your intervention ladies and gentlemen before we uh, go on to the question answer session it is my privilege to give the platform for a special remarks to our director general bk sharma a distinguished and decorated officer of the indian army is the director of the united services institute of india he has held prestigious assignments in india and abroad including command of a mountain division on the chinese border and as a senior faculty member at the national defense college new delhi he has represented india at the un as a military observer in central america and has been india's defense attache in central asia jal sharma specializes in strategic net assessment methodology scenario building and strategic gaming over to you sir i think you are uh, you have to unmute yourself sir i said thank you colonel kalwant for moderating this session and uh, thanks to uh, mrs vijay uh, director general icwa for partnering with the usi and particularly general pk goswami and uh, general bodlai uh, who have been the i would say the motivating force in putting all these events together uh, now we have had very interesting discussion and perhaps from the best of uh, experts with the hands on experience of this uh, 
responsibility to protect and protection of civilians. So I will not get into those things uh, because you are very current and you understand what the problem is. I would just say that uh, even uh, when the intrastate uh, conflicts were not very common and these were typical interstate conflicts, the sole purpose of uh, UN intervention was actually protection of civilians. What were we protecting? We were protecting civilians. And now this problem has become more complex because you have intrastate complex where there are host of actors who are coming into play. And uh, these are mostly in those countries which are ungoverned spaces where there is total anarchy, lawlessness, and there is no semblance of a government, even if notionally you may call a particular dispensation as a government. But it may not actually be government and it, it has its own uh, biases and its own proclivities towards the whole conflict. And that complicates the problem. For example, if you look at today, I'm just giving you an example in Afghanistan. You have a Haqqani network dominant Pashtun nationalist dispensation there, which is just representing 42% of the population. And that to the 42% may not be on board. What happens now, rest of the agitating civilians in the country? And while that is as it may be, now you have the new kid on the block and that is Daesh, Islamic State of Khorasan province, where it is initiating this sectarian terrorist attack or on almost every, on daily basis. And similar conditions are prevalent in some of these African countries as we heard during the presentation. So this has become a very, very complex problem. Now, while UN has put it in the mandate of the uh, peacekeepers, but peacekeepers have their own limitations because most of the time, the government of the day, which is supposed to be the bastion or the mainstay of this civilian protection, they themselves, either they are lackadaisical or they are not in a position to, or they don't understand the magnitude of the problem, or they don't have the capacity to render that. And willy nilly, what happens? The whole load comes on to the UN peacekeepers, and they are held accountable as an inter interventionist or as a as a as a UN peacekeeper. Now, it is very correct that unless we have a multi-dimensional approach wherein all the stakeholders, right from UN to the government, civil society, NGOs, and the very education of the people, if these are not addressed on multi prongs and in a holistic manner, we will only be pressing the bubble uh, or the, 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 the little bit of a bulge in a balloon at one place, and it is going to manifest at another. So it's going to be a lingering problem. I'm sure that the people who are planning these operations, they are seized of most of these issues. But where I say that uh, the think tanks can play a major role. Uh, we have the leeway of looking at this problem from a detached viewpoint. And to that extent, I think organizations like ICWA, USI, NUPI, SPAWN should work together with the different uh, centers for UN, UN peacekeeping operation, and also with the UN office. A lot of thinking and uh, actually crystal gazing can be offloaded by the UN headquarters to some of these think tanks, so that we are a help to the UN peacekeeping planning, planning officers and the planning office. So to that extent, I think uh, this uh, concept of uh, uh, these series of seminars that we have started, it needs a wider uh, uh, circulation. It needs a wider engagement. To that extent, I think uh, uh, we would be thinking through with ICWA that how, at least in India, uh, we become a core here and then start partnering with other think tanks. Uh, the only mantra here is free M2 diplomacy. Uh, once the balloon is up or the fire has been ignited, there is very little you can do. So how we resort to preventive diplomacy is the art. Yesterday I was uh, talking to Ambassador Akhruddin, who was our permanent 
representative at the UN. And he said, look, there is a very serious thought at the UN headquarters that the days of large missions are over now. Uh, UN is very, very reluctant to take these large missions and every other day there is a reduction of UN mission and the whole focus is going to shift on responsibility to protect as part of preventive diplomacy. What we as think tanks can do, what uh, contribution we can make to the whole ideation of, and its implementation, I think uh, we are ready to uh, play our role and I'm sure with the passage of time, this concept of our interactive dialogue would gain traction and uh, hopefully we would be a major contributors to, to this very complex and very big humanitarian problem. So with these words, I hand over back to the chair. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are actually uh, just at the end of it and uh, I would uh, like to request Ambassador Vijay Thakur's permission if we can uh, move it ahead by 10 minutes, ma'am. Would that be okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. There are a host of questions which have come. In fact, uh, uh, we have uh, one of our colleague, Colonel Mustafiz, who is uh, from Bangladesh, and he has uh, uh, posted a long uh, this thing. Mustafiz, I am very sorry. I'll just read out some of the points. Um, he was a battalion commander in uh, in uh, Congo in Gunia, and he says that uh, the major challenge for him was that how do you translate these theoretical construct or concepts or framework of protection of civilians into the tactical orders for the troops to understand? Because anything goes wrong at the tactical level, things can really go very bad right up to the strategic level. Uh, we all know that, and uh, that's that's uh, and uh, another point which he had given is that uh, the mission in uh, probably uh, you know Kivu or in uh, in Bunia will be totally different in Congo than what is expected in South Sudan or or Central African Republic. Uh, we will definitely agree with you, and thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. Uh, now, first question uh, for Brigadier uh, Joshi. Uh, has there been any incident that took place either in your sector or AOR of Onmis, wherein peacekeepers found it difficult to use force to protect innocent civilians fearing retaliation by the armed groups? If so, what was the level uh, of decision? Uh, Brigadier Joshi, uh, if uh, I understood the question correctly, it is as uh, an armed group actually tried to interfere with the work of the UN, sir. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, very frankly, sir, the time that I have been here, we have not uh, come across uh, such kind of a situation because uh, uh, as of now, the the peace agreement uh, or the revitalized uh, agreement which is here has held. Uh, and the major players, the major political players are all part of the uh, political process. They are signatories to the agreement and uh, really uh, none of their uh, militias or their armed uh, forces as such have ever attempted that. But yes, uh, one must uh, understand that there are large number of, uh, uh, I would say, militias who are acting outside the peace agreement, that some of them are like just communities which are on themselves, and then there are, yes, certainly certain groups who are outside the peace agreement uh, who are also active. And though not targeting the peacekeepers themselves, they do, they have targeted the humanitarian actors, and we found that say, if uh, the World Food Program has gone to uh, deliver food supplies to a certain place. We find that trucks have got ambushed, the drivers have got killed, the food has got stolen, and uh, it, it's very, really, really difficult to pinpoint who has done it. So uh, one theory would be that uh, it is one of the rebel factions who has done it to deliberately to keep the humanitarians out of that place. And the other would be, again, uh, accusations to say that it is the SSPDF or the government soldiers themselves who have done it, because uh, they are not paid enough and uh, 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 because of lack of salaries and uh, shortages, uh, they have resorted to crime. So uh, it's difficult to say that, but yes, I would uh, like to say that uh, uh, we haven't encountered uh, 
uh, I would say hostility in that manner. You, you and has not got any. Uh, we have not faced that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joshi. Uh, question for Dr. Ali uh, has come from one of the delegates. Uh, you emphasized a robust peacekeeping. Of you were talking in a different term. Uh, but how uh, are you going to distinguish between too much robustness of peacekeeping operations and peace enforcement? Uh, uh, Will not the blurring of line between peacekeeping and peace enforcement cause failure of the peacekeeping operation itself? Uh, thanks, uh, Colonel. Do Dr. Ali. The, um, the blurring of the lines is taking place. We've got alongside peacekeeping operations, you've got elements which are chapter seven authorized by the UN Security Council and undertaking <laughs> UN enforcement, uh, peace enforcement operations. The force intervention brigade is one such innovation in UNESCO. Uh, earlier from the mid 90s, a great example of failure of that particular innovation. Of the lines uh, puts the peacekeepers in harm's way because you have an element of them that cannot really be distinguished by people on the ground from the peacekeeping operation, also uh, undertaking peace and force. Uh, that, in a sense, um, uh, it's an innovation, it's, been it's, it's not a precision, it is responsible to, it is responsive for a particular uh, 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 set of a constellation of factors. It's perhaps, uh, you know, yeah, excusable. And after all, the results will show, you know, what they did to the M23, et cetera. Those are the results, and therefore uh, you could say that it works. In terms of the, uh, the theory behind it, it goes back to the Bosnian experience, where uh, Colonel uh, C. Dobby, uh, and he he uh, put out the Dobby Doctrine, in which he talks about the strategic level of consent and the tactical level of consent, with tactical level amenable to being trifled with, and not the strategic level. So yes. Uh, I quite agree. I am of the opinion that peace enforcement and uh, peacekeeping should not be in the same kettle. Since the Security Council is doing it that way, we need to manage it well. The problem is if you give the West a finger, they will take the arm. And you've seen what uh, happened with Operation Sarval, Operation Barkhan, uh, Operation Turquoise, etc., where you would say, oh, uh, what happened in Libya? Uh, but then we are going to R2P territory where I do not wish to go right now. But I think uh, we should uh, try and uh, push back against this particular, you know. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ali. Uh, there are actually a number of questions for Dr. Cedric, but uh, he is uh, not with us. Uh, and we have only time, I think, just to take up uh, one more question. Uh, and I'll obviously go back to Brigadier Joshi again. Uh, the dynamic nature of the places in which UN missions operate means that the security situation can change very quickly. You uh, obviously was bringing this out. Uh, do you think a rep rapid reaction force at the UN or regional level would be kept trained and ready to intervene in case situation goes out of hand? Something like the long range patrol groups of the British forces in Mali. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, concept which has been debated many a times. What is your uh, uh, feel on the ground? Uh, so I would like to say that uh, to an extent that is already happening here in Unmis, where we have, uh, 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 like I brought out earlier, the surface connectivity is really bad. And so air mobility is what we rely on a lot. And at the force headquarters level, we have uh, 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 a kind of reserve troops who are earmarked for uh, uh, bringing about a surge in any place. So there's an air readiness company, there's a, again a rapid reaction uh, forces, companies and battalions who are uncommitted under the force commander, can be used rapidly, moved uh, through heavy lift helicopters to any part of the country to stabilize the situation if required. Now, whether that should work at a regional level uh, uh, and uh, 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 cater for uh, a number of ongoing missions like we have the neighboring mission in the DRC, and you say a common uh, air readiness component, which could either work there or work here, that needs to be looked into under because the mandates are different, the 
the legal aspects of it need to be looked into but i think uh, at the uh, country level it's already happening thank you very much yep. uh, dr joshi uh, uh, now that we are almost running out of time uh, in conclusion i would only say you know i am i am working on this uh, epon uh, protection uh, study and we are doing a study on um, central african republic mali and south sudan uh, and we've been interviewing a lot of uh, humanitarian component workers down there on the ground uh, two three things which come out uh, very clearly is that one is that while the force leadership is very very and the mission leadership is very very conscious of protection mandate uh, but there is a lack of coordination you know there's there is a lack of collaborative effort that is one thing which is coming from everywhere uh, everybody has now started talking about that protection is the responsibility of the local government and where are there are security sector reforms taking place and the you know gcs people are working on uh, uh, various types of justice system improvement but still the governments are not capable and whenever something goes wrong they normally blame it on the un un so collaboration is one aspect and the coordination in fact dr cedric also talked about uh, you know various kinds of co coordination um, i think it's a tactical level uh, experience is always going to be different than uh, what the mandate talks about uh, so um, with that um, for the closing remark i request ambassador vijay thakur singh director general indian council of world affairs uh, ambassador vijay thakur is a career diplomat with multilateral experience during her service with the ministry of external affairs government of india she was the high commissioner of india to singapore and ireland and prior to that a joint secretary to the president of india and joint secretary at the national security council secretariat she also handled <laughs> afghanistan and pakistan desks in the ministry of external affairs and was the counselor in the embassy of india in kabul she was also a counselor in the permanent mission of india in the united nations in new york she retired in september 2020 as secretary east ministry of external affairs over to you ambassador Ma'am, you have to unmute uh, your mic. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Thank you so much. And of course, I can say that today's discussions have been extremely informative and detailed. I would like to thank Mr. David Herrier for his keynote address, and all the panelists for their very insightful remarks. Of course, ICWA and USI are collaborating on a series of webinars relating to the UN peacekeeping operations. And today we touched on the very important aspect of protection of civilians. Of course, UN peacekeeping operations are a very essential, are a very essential tool at the hands of the international community for maintaining global peace and security. We do know that a few decades ago, most UN peacekeeping operations were engaged in post intra interstate conflicts once a ceasefire had been agreed to. But today, in contrast, more than two thirds of the UN peacekeepers are involved in more complex intrastate conflicts. These are new circumstances that have brought our peacekeepers into close contacts with civilians without any ceasefire agreements in place. Therefore, to, therefore, today, uh, discussion has also showed how violence as a result of intrastate conflicts between different warring groups have increased the complexity of UN peacekeeping operations. This tests the capability of the UN PKOs to not only bring back peace in conflict zones, but also to deal with the issue of innocent civilians caught in conflict. And this is a challenge for the UN. The UN has been looking at it, as it was mentioned in the discussions. Historically, the first resolution on the protection of civ civilians was adopted by the UN Security Council in 1999. And thereafter, with the responsibility to protect doctrine passed by the UN General Assembly in 2005, the international community accepted greater responsibility for protecting civilians from atrocities. 
and given the challenging, changing and the challenging nature of the emerging uh, security challenges, many speakers referred to the, uh, to the 2015 POC guidelines, which provide for a three-tiered approach to protect civilians. All the three tiers were discussed. Tier one, protection through dialogue and engagement. Tier two, uh, the provision of physical protection. Tier three, the establishment of a protective environment. Now, these concept of core concepts have been endorsed by the member states of the, U of the UN. But today's discussions also reflected on some issues which highlighted the importance of a multidimensional approach to UN peacekeeping operations. And in this context, many speakers referred to the need for having an integrated approach on the various issues that the UN peacekeeping operations deal with. This is important, this aspect of integrated approach is important because for any mission to succeed, both the civilian and the military components need to deliver. I'm aware, we are aware that policymakers need to continue to take steps towards looking at the approaches of the UN peacekeeping operation. So from today's discussion, we could really look at four critical issues which were highlighted. One was addressing the gaps which exists. These exact, if you look at it today, these UN peacekeeping operations lack critical enabling capacities such as intelligence acquisition, force sustaining capacities, rapid reaction capacities, among others. These gaps need to be closed. The second aspect referred to was the training of peacekeepers. These missions require peacekeepers from various backgrounds and experiences to be trained to common standards and capabilities. This is important for, important for protection of peacekeeper, uh, for protection of civilians. There was also a mention of the language skills that need to be highlighted in respect of certain peacekeeping operations. I think that could also be a valid point as we look at training of peacekeepers. The third aspect highlighted was the need for technology and innovation. Technology can be harnessed for missions, uh, uh, mission achieving its targets and goals, but we do need to look at technologies which are cost effective, reliable, under field conditions and do have early warning and early response capabilities as required for operations. And the last point, which is really important for the protection of civilians, which has been highlighted by several speakers, was the importance of women peacekeepers. Because if you are looking at protection of civilians, the women also need to be protected in very special ways. So I think this is what I could make from, uh, from the various points which were highlighted. But clearly, this topic needs more discussion, and uh, we would continue. I'm sure policymakers will continue to look at it within the UN system. That, that would need to work very closely with US member states to look at that goal of protection of civilians in conflict zones. So, with these words, I once again thank everybody for their participation, and I'm sure we get away from this table with much much to think about and also to reflect upon what was said today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, are, we are just about 15 minutes over time. I think uh, uh, that's, that's uh, probably was uh, uh, required because the topic itself is so important. It has been a pleasure to listen to the experts on a very important topic of protection of civilians under UN mandate. With that, if we meet again, back to you, General Goswami. Uh, thank you, uh, Karan Sharma. It's, uh, at the end, I had to just th thank everyone for participation. I'll particularly li like to thank Charlie and Edward. Despite the uh, so different timings and the diff difficult or your busy schedule, you still took a time to join us. Thank you very much. And my friend from Bangladesh and Korea, they have also uh, joined uh, today uh, with this thing. I, I was trying to contact the Commandant uh, Bangladesh Peacekeeping Center because we thought okay, that let's expand our uh, circuit to join with others and do some joint event. Gentlemen, just for your information, in the near future, we'll, our next webinar is uh, likely to be on the uh, women, peace and security, another very important uh, aspect of the, as our Ambassador uh, Vijay Thakur Singh has brought out that participation of women 
in any uh, activity, whether it is a, in your house, whether it's outside on the streets or any social circuit, they have a very important and a presence of women as it is brings peace to some extent, people get restricted. So we will be deliberating more in detail in the next webinar, which I don't think uh, uh, any time in this part of this end of the year we'll be able to organize it. I think I'll take it to the January because as it is from 15 December onward, the number of countries or the people will be on leave or moving out for the celebrations. So hopefully uh, plan to join, join us sometime in December, uh, sorry, sometime in January next year. And in between, we may be having some uh, talks being organized. We are starting a new series of the talks on the UN theme, which I'll be sharing with you on the email. And hopefully uh, next month we should have, uh, or in early December, we should have the first talk being initiated by us. Thank you very much. And please uh, stay safe.